Okay. Is is Nina on? Okay. Nina's frozen. Okay. Well, welcome welcome to the uh, the June seventeenth meeting of the Planning Board, the Pekema Port Planning Board. I'm Tom Boak, Chairman. This is a virtual meeting. We are using Zoom conferencing format. The agenda is has been is out there for a way to get in. If you want to go in through Zoom, you can use meeting number nine five nine two eight five six seven seven nine three. You can also dial in on phone with a number of area code 929-205-6099 or 312-626-6799 and enter that same meeting ID of 959-256-2856-7793. Anyway, if you are using Zoom and your cable or, or YouTube to view this meeting, may, make sure you turn down your volume if you actually get around to be trying to speak because we'll get feedback. You can, all, as always, you can watch us on channel 1301 or stream us on YouTube at Kenny Bunkport Television. During the meeting, only the planning board and current participant are selected by the board will be on the screen with audio connected. All other will be blacked out and audio muted, except when the board solicits public input. So we are doing a public meeting here, uh, for three public meetings, in fact. So we will be doing that uh, when we get around to it. Appreciate your, short, your support and patient, patient as we work through this process. Now I'm going to take a roll call. And I think we're in pretty good shape. I'm here. Tom Boak. Nina is frozen. <laughs> no, she's okay. But Nina is there. Ed. Yep. Francis. Yep. Ed Francis. Larry is is over there. Yep. Okay. Uh, Scott. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And George. Yes. And John. Here. We are. Okay. So we have everybody here. Now, uh, I, if uh, at this point we'd like to ask the uh, Kenny Bunkport uh, Public Tele or Kenny Bunkport Television Maine folks to, if they have anything to say to explain what the audience needs to do. Okay, so process. Okay, so at this point, I will introduce the. Well, I have to start start the meeting, which the first step in the meeting is to. Uh, we've is to approve the minutes of the last meeting, so. Uh, I, everybody should have received them in their email by now. Are there any uh, problems or questions on the minutes from the last meeting? If not, can I get a motion to approve them? So moved. And I need a second. That's Larry. Second. Larry, and a second from Nina. Okay. So uh, I'm in favor now. Uh, Nina? Yes, no? Favor. Okay. Ed? Yes. Larry? Yes. Scott? Yes. George and Tom, yes. John don't, don't need to vote on this, but they're they're here, so. They'll say yes anyway. They'll say yes anyway, because they're not. <laughs> OK.
Okay, when we get to a, an agenda item, we will request the applicant or their representative to raise their virtual hands, then acknowledge them, and uh, David will promote them to panelists, and they will be able, be able to, they'll be visible and be able to uh, be discussing their, uh, their item. Once that is complete, we will go through the board see if there are any more additional questions and then uh, after that we will we in this case these are all public hearings so we would open a public hearing repeat ask for a butters first then general public second and again we'll have to add, raise your hands once all the input has been given i'll close the public hearing and invite the board to deliberate call upon each member uh, if we need any additional clarification, then they they will uh, proceed to vote on the on the item. Okay, so first item on the agenda is number two zero zero three zero one Edward and Lana Bassett minor subdivision change. This is the public hearing for an approval to add 0. 0.41 acres to their land through purchase to create a larger buffer on Oxpow Lane, uh, tax map 37, block three, lot four, and free enterprise. Now, uh, hopefully um, Mr. Bassett is there and can, can get uh, recognized. Okay, so Mr. Bassett, if you could uh, discuss again, discuss briefly your uh, your uh, okay. Okay, good. Okay, I see. I see his name. <laughs> Hello? Okay. I think that's what happened the last time, too, for some reason. They can't seem to get the camera working. Okay, well, much as we'd love to see you, why don't you proceed and tell us again about your about this uh, for the public that's uh, now connected and uh, potentially hearing about this? Okay, my name is Edward Bassett, and I am the applicant for this uh, change in property. Um, we have purchased this 0 0.41 acre, and it appears to be attached to one lot, and we would like to detach that and attach it to our lot for our property. Um, the purpose of it is simply a buffer uh, to continue the buffer that we have out there. Um, there will be no changes to it. There is no building. There is no septic. There is no water. It's just land. And uh, we, we use it as a kind of a runway for a bunch of animals to get through, really. Uh, but it's, it's kind of a neat little thing to have. And we would like to have that purchase to add to our land. Okay, I think that pretty well. Uh, we discussed this pretty thoroughly last last time. To uh, you know that your all lots are are legal uh, conforming lots after after this change, so that there's no no difficulties in it. So uh, I guess the does anybody any of our planning board members have a comment about this? at this point before we open the public hearing. John, uh, you, you've uh, taken this as yours. Do you have any comments about it or are you just ready to go? Ready to go. 
Okay. All right, I see no other planning board members that wish to speak at this point. So uh, what I would uh, like to do is open up the public hearing. First for abutters, if there are any people raising their hands. So if David, you see anybody raising a hand for and feeling abutters anybody at all, <laughs> that's fine too. Not surprised, quite honestly, but. <laughs> okay. Um, in that case, I'm I'm thinking we we should just uh, close the public hearing at this point. And now, if uh, any of the members of the planning board would like to speak on this item. Uh, Please do so, unmute and do so. Uh, if not, I guess we need to get a, a motion to, uh, to approve this, this minor subdivision modification. So I'll... I'll make a motion. Okay, so Nina makes a minor subdivision uh, modification. Okay, good. And someone seconded, I thought I heard. That was Ed. Okay, Ed seconded. Okay, well, again, we're going to go through uh, in order of the five, in this case, the five regular planning board members. So I, I, I'm, an, I'm an I. Nina? I. Ed? I. Larry? I. And Scott. Hi. Okay. Well, this is approved. And uh, actually, uh, there is, Mr. Uh, Harcourt has written a finding of facts, which we can read right now. Now, the, the deal on findings of fact is that we, we will read it and approve it. But since we're not all in the same place to sign it, when then some sometime in the next week or so, or as soon as possible, preferably, go, wander down to town hall, and Lisa will socially distance, distantly <laughs> ask you a copy to sign, and you sign it and give it back to her. Agreed. <laughs> okay, so, John, why don't you proceed to read? Okay, this. Kenny Bunkport Planning Board, findings of fact and decision in the application of Edward P. Bassett and, Le and Lona J. Bassett and Geraldine C. Ceres, minor revision of subdivision, Radisson Builders subdivision, Oxplow Lane and Kennebunkport, to transfer 0.41 acres from existing lot number 11, Geraldine C. Ceres, to existing lot number 12, Edward P. Bassett and Lana J. Bassett. Following a review pursuant to the Kenny Bunkport subdivision regulations and land use organization on ordinance on June 3, 2020, and a public hearing on June 17, 2020, the Kenny Bunkport Planning Board makes the following findings of fact and conclusions and renders the following decision subject to the conditions enumerated below. Findings of fact are as follows. The applicant is Edward P. Bassett and Lana J. Bassett, here and after the applicant, with a mailing address of 35 Oxplow Lane, Kennebunkport, Maine. The applicant property has a street address of 35 Oxplow Lane, Kennebunkport. The properties are identified as Map 37, Block 3, Lot 21, and Map 37, Block 3, Lot 23 on the Municipal Tax Assessor's maps. The transferee of Butter, Ceres, here and after the transferee, property is identified as Map 37, Block 3, Lot 21 on the Municipal Tax Center's maps. Both the applicant property and the transferee property are located in the Free Enterprise Zone. The transferee has demonstrated a legal interest in the property by providing a copy of a warranty deed 
recorded in the York County Register of Deeds, Book 14376, pages 42 through 44. The applicant has demonstrated a legal interest in their property by providing a copy of a warranty deed recorded in the York County Register of Deeds, Book 14376, pages 39 through 41. In a letter dated May 21, 2020, the transferee, through a power of attorney, a copy of which was provided, authorized the applicant to act as their legal agent for this matter. The applicant and transferee have provided a fully executed land sale contract for vacant land located at 34 Oxplow Lane and further described as Lower Village Survey dated 5-25-2005 as area added to lot 11, 17,935 square feet, 0.41 acres, recorded as, as book 302, page 37. A survey created by the Lower Village Survey Company dated 3-20-2020 indicates both properties will meet or exceed minimum lot size requirements for free enterprise zone. Transfer poses no negative impact from free enterprise minimum lot size requirements. Applicant has submitted a minor revision subdivision application received March 20, 2020. Applicant has not requested submission waivers and has presented a complete and detailed application. Applicant has requested no performance standard waivers from requirements of the Kenny Bunkport Land Use Ordinance. Conclusions. In accordance with Articles 7, 8, and 9 of the Town of Kenny Bunkport Subdivision Regulations, the Planning Board grants approval of the applicant's minor revision subdivision application. Decision. The minor revision subdivision application identified above is hereby approved. This approval must be recorded with the Registry of Deeds within 90 days of approval or it becomes null and void unless an extension is granted by the board in writing. The applicant comply, will comply with all terms and conditions of the Town of Kenny Bunkport Ordinance and subdivision regulations and all applicable federal and state regulations and approvals as well as those specified in the final application, all of which are incorporated herein by reference. Dated June 17, 2020, the Kenny Bunkport Planning Board. Okay, so, so I, I guess we'll one more time go through. I need to have someone again make a, a, a motion to approve this. Uh, approve the, this uh, reading, this finding of facts. I'll make a motion to approve the findings of facts. Nina moves it. I'll second it. And I'm in, I'm in favor. And Nina? In favor. Ed? Ed's frozen. OK. No, Ed's, Ed's muted. I my sorry my unmute wasn't working. Um, <laughs> I, I yeah. Okay, but you're in favor. I take yes. It. Okay, Larry. Uh, yes. Scott. In favor. Okay. So, as as I said before, the the finding of facts will get. Uh, Lisa will will print it out and then we'll we'll go down and sign it. And once once the whole thing is signed, someone presumably someone in town hall will notarize it, and uh, and then at which point Mr. Bassett has to take and get it recorded. Is that correct, Werner? And you're muted. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, we'll go ahead and uh, yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have it printed out here, and then uh, yeah. The, if the board members, uh, if you want to swing by, um, you know, Thursday or Friday to sign that, we'll make sure that we have it here available for you. Right. Okay. And then you'll tell Mr. Bassett when that's been completed. So that's, that he that's correct. Yep. We'll let Mr. Bassett know when it's ready to be picked up so he can get it recorded. Okay. Super. 
Okay. Thank you very much, members of the board. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we're going to move on to the second item in the agenda, which is number 200503, Michael McKellar doing business as Newport, New Point LLC. This is a public hearing on his site plan it's for approval to convert an existing landscape equipment warehouse back to its original permitted use as a lobster and seafood distribution warehouse on 184 Beechwood Avenue, tax 24 block one, lot uh, 14B, farm and forest zone. So if uh, Dave could, uh, could locate uh, Mr. Mr. McKellar. Okay. There he is. Hi, guys. Okay. So please, uh, this is the public hearing on your application. If you could uh, reiterate uh, your application and, and it would probably help to go through some of the comments that you've been receiving from, from abutters so that, uh, you know, to see what, what, what it is you're doing to uh, help them out. So, <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, my name is Mike McKellar. Um, I am the applicant uh, and owner of New Point LLC. I live at uh, 100 Oak Ridge Road uh, in Kenny Bunkport. Uh, um, under contract currently for 184 uh, Beechwood Avenue, um, which is currently uh, a landscaping facility uh, warehouse. Uh, I'm looking to convert that use uh, back to uh, seafood distribution uh, use, uh, which was its original use. Although uh, what was happening there prior was is, is completely different, um, I guess, uh, so to speak. And I can explain that further in a moment. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm slated currently to close on that property on July 3rd, um, and then would commence um, my business operations uh, shortly after that. Um, had the meeting with you folks uh, two weeks ago and kind of explained what it was that I was looking to do. Um, I can briefly go over that. I'm running a small operation which would employ myself um, and maybe uh, two others, but probably one to start. Um, a portion of my business is a brokerage, um, which is essentially just putting deals together over the phone, which don't take place um, at the location that we're discussing. Um, another portion is fulfillment um, of orders that are going to be shipped direct to restaurants, um, the majority of which are out of state, um, or fulfillment for e-commerce, um, folks that are looking to have live lobster or lobster meat, lobster roll kits, those kinds of things uh, sent directly to their homes around the country. Uh, so essentially what I will be doing is bringing in product that's already pre-packaged, 90% uh, of which will be frozen um, and a small portion will be fresh. Um, again, pre-packaged um, and then I will fulfill orders, pick and pack as orders come in. Um, they'll be picked up uh, by UPS carrier in the afternoon and then sent uh, to wherever uh, their destination is. Um, outside of that, um, there's, there's really not much to the business. Um, there's no processing going on. There's no uh, live lobster holding, uh, fish cutting, anything of that nature. Again, prepackaged goods that are that are picked and packed for fulfillment of orders. Um, I received a few letters from from abutters um, who have had concerns uh, in the past with um, some of the other businesses that that have been there, um, mostly uh, pertaining to, to noise, uh, to truck noise, um, you know, large vehicles backing up. Um, 
equipment uh, moving around at you know the wee hours of the morning, uh, which is completely understandable. Um, I can't really speak to um, Terrapin's business because I'm not in the landscaping uh, business and how he operates, but I know um, Alan, um, owner of uh, Cape Porpoise Lobster, who was there formerly prior to Terrapin, um, is also in the seafood and lobster industry, but um, what uh, Cape Porpoise Lobster does is much different than, than what I'm looking to do. Um, I don't know exactly about his business, but I know enough to know that he's dealing a lot more in live lobster, um, in bait, dealing directly with fishermen, buying lobsters, um, which can happen at all hours of the day um, and requires uh, larger trucks to, to bring lobsters in, to take them out, um, and things of that nature. So um, I think there's some apprehension um, that maybe some of the, the noise complaints that happen with Cape Corpus Lobster would continue because I'm also a seafood uh, broker uh, or seafood business, uh, but our, our businesses couldn't be, you know, further apart from one another. So, um, but yeah, I'm glad to answer any questions um, and, and regard and, and anything that um, had been mentioned in regard to noise. I, I think another outside of trucks um, was potential equipment because I am planning to put a, a small cooler and small freezer um, on the property. Um, essentially, there are walk-ins that you would see at a, a restaurant, eight by 12 units that are put together. They're self-contained units um, in order to store product. I think there's some concern that those compressors may make noise. I think the size of the units is so small that the noise will be inconsequential, but um, if there is noise, uh, I'm glad to make any mitigating changes, fencing, whatever's needed to uh, make sure that that noise is uh, kept uh, as quiet as possible. Okay. Um, the first step is to go through the board to see if we have any additional questions. Um, I guess, Larry, you were the uh, case manager, so you can start, I guess. Oh, hi, Mike. Uh, Larry Simmons here. So I was just wondering if you had a chance to verify whether, you know, what, whether you're going to have any ammonia in your cooling system. And I really, uh, okay. Okay, thank you. And in fact, I've written up the, uh, the finding of facts to say you won't have any hazardous materials on site. So that's good. And then um, I, I did notice that, you know, I got the, the, the letter confirming the concerns of the abutters uh, concerning the noise. And apparently the um, refrigerator and freezer uh, unit that was there when this property was previously used for the uh, processing of uh, seafood was real noisy. So uh, it's, it's great to hear you say you'll you'll mitigate the um, you know, if there's a noise issue. And um, so so I have written a couple of um, requirements into the finding of facts, which basically refers to EPA uh, and OSHA requirements that um, the uh, concerning noise levels in residential areas, because you know the, the 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 interesting thing about your property is it abuts residences. Okay, so so I did I did uh, say that um, I'm just quoting you know just taking the info right off the right of the EPA website that, that um, the um, the sound level during the day would be no more than 55 decibels on the A scale at residences, uh, and then at night no more than 47 decibels on the A scale. Uh, from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then, of course, you know, there's the one about the 85 decibels for uh, workers during an eight-hour day. So, um, you know, I've, I've written that in, and and I know that there are apps that can be downloaded for your iPhone, for instance, that actually measures noise levels. So it'll be pretty easy to verify uh, what the noise level is. Um, well, anywhere, you know, if, either the abutters or, or yourself. <clears throat> And then, uh, then I started thinking about the, you know, ways to mitigate that sound if the compressors, uh, if if they if they were um, a bit noisy, and you know the, uh, you know, some sort of baffling, some sort of enclosure with uh, various uh, sound absorbing materials, you know, would probably do it. 
Um, but of course that's down the road, you know, may not, may not need it. But, uh, but the reason I throw that in there is I, I feel like if there is a, uh, an apparent noise issue, it, it, the, the solution is, is available. Okay. I don't see it as a, as a stumbling block. <clears throat> so, um, anyway, that, that was really the, 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 the gist of my comments. And, um, I appreciate the, your, your, uh, your speedy response in, in reply to uh, all the questions. Yep, no, absolutely. And just I'll say um, to your point about um, K Porpoise Lobster and um, the air cooler and freezer, the cooler that he had there was a much larger unit because it was built into the building. Um, so he had outdoor compressors, um, I would imagine, um, being in the industry as long as I've been. Um, that would have to run those, uh, the compressor and condenser unit combos um, inside. So I would imagine they're much larger units than what I'm anticipating using. Um, the freezer that I think he had there was probably about the same size, but again, the units that they make now, um, they're so self-contained. Um, I'm not feeling that noise is going to be an issue. Quite frankly, I, I go up next to them at restaurants and markets and things. You can't even hear them. But again, if they are a factor in noise for anybody or anybody feels uh, differently about it, I'm glad to do whatever it takes to, uh, to mitigate that sound. Okay, thank you. That's, that's all I got, Tom. Okay, thank you. Any, anyone else with uh, questions from the board? Scott, I do. Okay, Scott, thank you. Thank you. So, Mike, could you um, just tell us, you know, looking at some of these letters, the people are, um, they're nervous about, you know, large trucks. So, I, I, I imagine that an 18-wheeler can't get down there, but probably something that's 15 tons or above can. Could you just describe on a daily basis what kind of traffic is going to be there and what the approximate tonnage would be? Yeah, I, again, um, I don't anticipate really having any tractor trailers come there um, for any reason, um, quite frankly. So what I'll be doing is I'm gonna operate a small refrigerated vehicle, like a sprinter van or something like that, if you guys know what that is. But a, you know, a small vehicle that runs on you know, regular gasoline, it's, it's not very large, but it's refrigerated so that I can go and pick up deliveries. Um, again, a van size. I'll have that vehicle. Outside of that, I'll be packing boxes for UPS only. I'm not going to be doing maybe like Cape Corpus was running to Boston every day with large loads uh, to be distributed around the country. I'm going to have UPS being picking up styrofoam boxes on a daily basis. And maybe they pick up twice a day. But for the most part, um, it would be a, a one day pickup. So any UPS truck that you would see would probably be about the largest truck that will ever come into my facility. Um, and it'll come on a daily basis, Monday through Friday to pick up. Typically they pick up around 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'll have anywhere from 25 to 150 boxes potentially um, that would be picked up and shipped for delivery. Outside of that, um, I think the majority of the pickups or for the products that I need are going to be picked up by me personally um, at will calls from different distributors, whether that be frozen soup or Cisco or performance food groups or whatever I need. I'll be making those pickups in my delivery van, so to speak, um, and bringing them back to the facility. So I don't anticipate any large vehicles coming in at any time. And like I said in the last meeting, I get to a point where I need tractor trailers coming in at a regular basis, this facility is not going to cut it anymore anyway. Um, I'm going to be in a whole different ball game um, and going to need to be closer to the highway and I will have well outgrown this facility. This is just a, a starting point essentially for me um, and it's a great place locally for me to be and, and to kind of get the ball rolling, but I'm not, I'm not anticipating any large vehicles coming and going. Thank you, Mike. Okay, anyone else? Okay, well, I'm going to, uh, now I'm going to open up the public meeting. So if uh, some member of the, one of the abutters uh, would, would, would like to raise their hand 
and Dave can uh, get you uh, get you on on the air. I was going to. Well, then the talk is enough, I think. Hi there. Um, this is Laurie Dowdy. I am uh, right across the street uh, with my husband at 2 Hickory Lane. Um, so our driveway looks right out on the driveway and the front of this property. So at the last meeting, one question that came up was, it, was there going to be any removal of trees? And I think there was a mention of some trees that were infringing on the septic system. I was curious as to what those trees were, what the location was, um, and would they be anything that would provide screening um, on the street side um, and therefore to our property? Because that's exactly, we look right over at the garage door uh, of the building. Yep, so I'm terrible with direction, but if you're looking at the building, um, they're on the far right corner um, of, the, uh, of the property. There's like a little small chain link fence there. And then there's some large shrub type trees, like three of them that sit on the, I would suppose it's the north corner um, that sit right there. And the only reason I would even remove them at all is because um, the septic inspector advise that I do so because they're uh, encroaching on the leach field and they're essentially going to destroy it um, if they're not removed, the root system. So um, that's the only reason why I would, I would take them down. Gotcha. And another question too, regarding what used to be, I think, a loading dock and what now appears to be the garage door on the front of the building, is that where deliveries and pickups are gonna take place and if so, is there a possibility to add some screening out on the front side of the building or out on the front side of the property? Um, I would imagine that, you know, myself with, a, with a, the van that I'm, I, I talked about, I would probably come and go through that door. There is a loading dock beyond that. Um, which an actual tractor trailer, if I was bringing one in, could come in. Um, or a box truck, um, maybe. Question. Well, my computer was doing something funky, sorry. Um, where a UPS style truck could come in, so that would be in the, the backside, kind of underneath um, where you would look at the garage, just beyond it. Um, could something be put up? I'm sure something could be put up. Um, I don't know if I tend personally see a need to, to put some fencing or, or screening up beyond that. I guess it's something that uh, I'm open to. But again, I, I think there's this conception that there's going to be all kinds of traffic coming and going and trucks in and out. And that's just not the case. Um, so I think it's, I think it, it wouldn't necessarily be necessary. I have one more question, and this might be for the planning board too, just to clarify the process, because the the guidelines, restrictions, um, approvals that you provide for the property in this particular instance for this application, if there was another successive uh, owner of the property, would those guidelines, restrictions, et cetera, uh, carry over to the new owner if it is the same use of the property. I just want to make sure we're not setting some kind of precedent for somebody else who would, who would come in in the future um, and maybe not have the same kind of limits to, to his business that he's explaining. I'll try, try and then we'll get Werner to voice afterwards, but we are approving a change of use from landscaping warehouse to this as described in our, our as, as will be described in our finding of facts. So I would, if they are, for instance, decide to, to do, he decides to go to six days 
a week or seven days a week or decides to have something other than the, the hours that he specified, that would be, I believe, a change of use. Is that true, Werner? Uh, so the findings that you develop, you know, and the conditions that you place, you know, upon it are, you know, will run with the property. So should should there be a change in tenancy, you know, to the property? So should um, should uh, Mike uh, choose to sell it to somebody else who's going to do the same thing and abide by those conditions? Uh, that would run you know, those conditions are going to run with the property. Uh, and if it's for the same use, it's just a change in tenancy. And those are the conditions that they have. And so it's, uh, you know, just a, a change in ownership wouldn't, uh, wouldn't bring somebody back to the board, uh, provided that they're doing the same use and, you know, and following the same conditions that have been, you know, set in place by the board. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. My understanding of that, Warner, is that if somebody were to come in and instead of wholesaling wanted to retail, have a retail business, that would be a change of use. They would have to go before the board. Yes, yes, that's correct. Yep. If there was going to be a retail component piece of it that's described as another, that's another type of use that's described and that would come back to this board. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, very good, thank you. Thank you uh, everyone for allowing us uh, some input in this. My name is Bill Bartlett. I live uh, with my wife at 208 Beachwood Avenue adjacent to the property under discussion. And um, appreciate uh, Mr. McKellar's presentation that sounds like a, a reasonable use. Um, in the past, when this property was operated as a, as a seafood distribution uh, point, there were a number of conditions placed on that use. And um, I submitted an email with a, a list of some of those conditions, similar to <clears throat> those that were in place before, that I would request be made part of the approval. Uh, there are two reasons for this. One is that uh, the conditions we're, I'm requesting would not interfere with the, the business Mr. McKellar has described. And, uh, and so there shouldn't be any, any interference in that manner. Um, I, but people in the past have described uses for property and then done something quite different. And uh, just to ensure or guard against that happening, I would like to see some conditions in place. The other reason is, is um, what uh, Ms. Dowdy alluded to as far as change of ownership. Without conditions in place, as a general approved use for seafood distribution, someone could come in with just a change of ownership and do something quite different if the uh, use wasn't restricted by some conditions. So uh, I don't know if the email that I submitted uh, made it to you folks. I did also write a letter for the last meeting outlining in general some of those conditions. And I, I asked them a little more specifically in my most recent email but they involve limits on the number of employees, limits on the hours and days of operation, limits on the uh, removal of vegetation, limits on the amount of time trucks can run, run and all that sort of thing. Again, I don't think any of them would interfere with Mr. McCullough's proposed use. And the idea would just be to ensure that it isn't being operated in that manner and that future owners couldn't expand beyond that. Uh, so I would, I would, uh, yeah, request that those conditions be reviewed and, and perhaps included in the approval uh, should the use be approved. I think you're going to find that in the findings of fact that were written up, there are quite a few limitations. Oh, okay. No, Tom whether you want to go through those now. Yeah. 
Yeah, yes, I would be interested in hearing because once the public hearing is closed, no further input is permitted as I understand it. So I think while the discussion is open, we'd be interested in, in hearing the, the various limitations. Well, I think, Larry, you've you've already included the, the same uh, five days a week, uh, the same hours that, uh, that Mike uh, has mentioned, is that correct? Well, that's right. I think as I was sitting here listening to the concerns, I think most of the, all, all those items are covered in the finding of facts um, and um, including the limits on the hours of operation and the uh, amount of time that a truck can be idling. Um, you know, for if a truck idles more than five minutes, um, the uh, applicant has agreed that it will be shut off and um, then there's a discussion in the finding of facts about the um, uh, pickup by the UPS just during afternoon hours, which would limit traffic and noise. Um, let's see what else. Um, Number of I think, of course, we, sorry. Number of employees. Uh, number of employees. Yeah, I've got. I've, well, I've, I, I have that in regard to the septic system. Um, and what it says is that the existing septic system has ex excess capacity. Four employees are planned. Uh, the, the septic is sized up to 20 employees, and it talks about other things that have to happen to the septic if, um, you know, if there's a need for some sort of disposal um, unit in the in the operation. Um, so the n limit on the number of employees is with regard to the septic and of course it reflects the the comments by the applicant that he would start with one or two and then get up to a maximum of four at which point he would be you know his operation would be too large for that particular facility is the idea then the i guess the the only other one that i've left that uh let's see i didn't really talk about cutting down trees because the only trees that are going to be removed are the ones with regard to the interfering with the septic system. Um, and let me see. I, I don't think I added that in here specifically. Larry, um, okay. you, have a, you have a condition that says the existing woodland buffers must be maintained explicitly. The, and you've also described right. that only the only the three plants are going to be removed. There we go. I knew I had something in there. <laughs> Just a question of finding it. Yeah. So I, I actually think I I think the finding of facts covers the concerns that have that have just been expressed. Yeah, and and let me just speak quickly on the the hours. Um, you know, my only concern with the hours is that's absolutely when I plan to operate. But for example, my dog was just barking here because the UPS guy was just coming up my driveway uh, delivering a package. I just don't want to pigeonhole myself to an extent where if there's a certain day when I've packed, let's call it 50 to 60 boxes. And for whatever reason, I have no control over UPS and the majority of the time they're there 334, four o'clock. They show up at 5.30 one day to pick up boxes that I'm expected to not load the UPS van after I've packed a number of boxes. That just wouldn't be appropriate, I don't think. Um, that's something that you know I couldn't, I couldn't operate under those parameters. I, I would think in the majority of the time, it'll be well within these, these hours, but I'm not going to put myself in a position that if it somehow he shows up at 5 30 or six o'clock oh i, I got to stop all operations that, that just wouldn't make a lot of sense for my business so so mike this is larry again so the way that i've addressed this 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 thought did occur to me as i was writing this out <clears throat> so uh the way i've addressed it as i said the commercial affiliate facility is intended for weekday activity activities only between the hours of 7 a.m and 5 p.m okay monday to friday so intended for the, that to those days and times um it's a little it's a little vague it does recognize the possibility that you know like you said the ups may be late i don't know so 
I didn't want to make it shall be only for 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I don't know why else to say it without, you know, um, to get, leave, you, leave you a bit of wiggle room on, um, well, handling issues that may come up that, you know, it requires you to operate outside those hours. Sure. No, that's fair enough. Larry, I, I did notice that in, in the, uh, the criteria that you put for noise abatement, that, that uh, yep. during the day, you said 55 dBA, and then the 47 dBA kicks in at 10, not, not yep. at 5. And I thought that was probably an, a hard cutoff then, that, that the 5 was what the intent was, and certainly not after, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, you're not going to be getting deliveries. Is, is, was that your intent, or is that just a... Well, I covered that up in the web. I took that off the EPA website. I didn't make that up. That's that's uh, you know it's a federal rule basically. Oh, the, the 10 p.m. Yeah, 10 p.m. Oh, to 6 a.m. Thank you. So I mean, we, we could change it if we want to, but I, I figured well, we, oh. you know, just leave it, leave it like that. I believe Unless there's an observer would know, but I think that's the local sound ordinance as well. You know, if the band's cut off at 10 o'clock. So, yeah, that's the way I wrote it up. Uh, and you know, uh, if there's if there's concerns, we can change it. It would be more stringent than what EPA requires. Well, I think you have to look at this as very much a balancing act. You're asking for a conditional use in a very high residential area. You're surrounded as kind of nutters. And so there are definitely going to be restrictions that you're going to have to abide by. Um, the residents only recourse after we approve an application is to go to Warner and ask for enforcement of those conditions, basically. Um, you know, um, we just did a conditional use out on North Street where the there wasn't going to be very much traffic, but North Street is very busy. And one of the things that, you know, or if, that the, um, the owner was going to do, and um, we probably would have restricted him to it, is to put up visual buffers for sound and for visibility so you don't see the facility. So in a residential area, when you're asking for a conditional use, you have to understand that, you know, you have to be very reasonable. There are going to be restrictions. And if you were allowing some leeway here, but if you continually go outside of those hours, then the residents. Uh, my, my idea here is that uh, you may need more visual buffers. One, you have a walk-in. Is that walk-in on the inside of the building or the outside? It's on the outside, but it's on the, the side that's already protected by the building. So it's on the opposite side um, of, you know, the, from the road side, so to speak. And then that whole section of the area is protected by trees. So I, I don't think that's a, a visual concern. And, the, and quite frankly, the building has been there operating with trucks coming and going with no visual barrier um, this entire time. So I don't know why I would be required to look well, into a visual barrier with less activity. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, the residents have complained um, in their letters about the comings and going. I'm more concerned with the walk-in and the compressor in that it, it may be a low volume compressor, but I have a jet. It's, you know, it does, and a compressor going on and off can be much more annoying than one that's on all the time. And I really, yes, you have to have that differential of thing, but uh, you might want to consider even putting more shrubbery around it or some sort of buffer barrier that really cuts the noise down to where the residents don't hear it 
switch on and off. And front is a very good when you have people coming and going home business we just get a few clients once in a while you're going to have regular traffic there you might consider some visual buffers for the abutters we are required to look at restrictions for conditional uses that's basically in the de definition of a conditional use um, it's, it's one that really requires conditions because you're usually surrounded by residents. And if you put up a business, you don't want it interfered. Absolutely. No, un understandable. As opposed to, you know, and there's obviously looking through the uses, there's, you know, certainly some other ways that it could go with permitted uses as, you know, timber management or uh, uh, animal husbandry which is also permitted use. So sometimes, um, I don't know. It's, I, I think what I'm proposing here is um, quite frankly, a, a minimal impact comparison to what other uses could potentially go into that property. But it is a conditional use and it will yep. have restrictions. So, and I would uh, suggest to you that you work very hard to abide by all those restrictions can't hear anything okay, okay. i think yeah. we had somebody else coming on <laughs> uh, did the, the that uh Dave, what's the status of the uh, people talking? Okay, could you put her on, please? Good evening. My name is Ann Campbell, and I live at 207 Beechwood Avenue. And um, I'm glad. Some other abutters have answered my questions, asked my questions, and um, I have a, a few other things to mention. And that is, in the last meeting, he asked, Mr. McKellar asked for um, the landscaping business to be able to operate until October out of there. And I think that's an extra use that I would prefer not to have be having if it's approved because that's additional trucks and things like that. And um, I got the, I'm the one who complained the most about the compressor and I really um, was affected by that. I didn't realize it until it was turned off. So anything you can do, Mr. McKellar, to minimize that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and that's about, that's about all I have to say. Thanks, Ann. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I understand the, the noise thing. Again, I live two miles down the road um, and the same kind of street, Oak Ridge Road, windy neighborhood. I, I get it. You know, I, I wouldn't want, I, I like my peace and quiet like everybody else does around here. Hence why we moved to Kenny Bunkport. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, inhibit that. I'm trying to, you know, add to the community uh, by, you know, starting a small local business. So I would certainly do my part to make sure that you guys can continue to enjoy your properties. I certainly wouldn't want to affect that. I want to be a good neighbor and just enhance um, the town by adding a, a small business to it and uh, that can contribute to the town. Um, in regard to um, Terrapin continuing to keep some of their stuff there until October 1st, that's not something that I've requested. That's something that uh, Mike Corsi has made part of the deal. Um, in fact, it's, 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 it's part of it. It's, it wouldn't necessarily be my choice um, to do that. Um, but without it, I'm not sure that I get a deal done. He is in the process of moving um, to another property um, and he's requested that um, he be able to keep some of his 
supplies there um, until he's able to, to uh, transport everything over to his new property. Obviously, he's in the midst of his busy season uh, with it being summer and everybody's uh, landscapes going. Um, so it's, he hasn't had the ability to, uh, to move everything over like he would have hoped. Um, but as far as the impression that I'm under is that he's not gonna be operating out of there. He's just going to be storing stuff. Occasionally he will have to get things uh, to take them to his new property or to a job. And then he'll have everything removed by October 1st. But that was at his request uh, of putting a deal together, not mine. Okay, well, um, he just had some uh, rocks delivered and um, so he is doing business over there. And I was just curious if that was gonna continue because I know it's real convenient if you're working you know, at Goose Rocks or anywhere compared to Kennebunk where his new place is. And so I was just curious um, how that was gonna go. Sure. Um, and again, you know, if he is coming in and out of there, he's going to have to, you know, abide by whatever restrictions are on place of me. You know, if he wants to bring a truck in to pick something up, it's not going to be able to idle for, for long. He's going to have to, uh, he's going to have to operate within the hours that have been described. Um, and certainly for me and my business, um, not, not that I'm going to have trucks in and out of there myself, but I, I've told Mike that you know, I don't need him impinging on my business by coming and going or doing anything that wouldn't work. So I don't think that's the intention. I think once I'm actually in there, he might have had something delivered because I'm not in there, nor do I tend to be uh, for a few more weeks. Um, so he's probably continuing to use the property because it's still his. Um, but after that, I would expect, um, you know, his uh, frequency of use to slow down dramatically. Well, did he explain to you what he thought his use would be um, in your agreement? The only use that the only thing that we've talked about is that he has the ability to come in um, and preferably with notice to me that he'll be coming in to pick something up on a certain day or, or whatever the case may be. Because, you know, the other portion of this, right, is, is safety of my product and my building and my employees. I can't um, be housing uh, lobster meat or, or, or you know, higher priced items uh, in, my, in my facility and have somebody else's employees coming and going, that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't work. Um, so he's gonna have to provide me with, with some sort of notice um, that he's gonna come in, he needs to pick something up, it's gonna be between the hours that have been described, I'm gonna approve that, he'll come in, do his thing and, and leave. So it's not gonna be a, it's not gonna be a frequent thing, um, but you know, again, this is more of a, uh, a verbal and handshake agreement that we have. It's not, well, you absolutely have to do X, Y, and Z. So, um, but I would imagine that he'll, he'll abide by that. It'll have to, quite frankly, if it's my property, uh, I'm not going to be able to, I won't let him on unless I approve of it, essentially. So he's, he's not going to be able to just come and go and have a key to my property without me knowing about it. Okay. Um, are you going to have any kind of all night lighting? Because right now there's a light that comes on, I think if a motion light and, um, or which is fine. Uh, but are you going to have one all day? I mean, all night. And um, are you, I hope if you're going to store lots of um, product that costs a lot that you have some sort of security of some sort. Yep. I plan to have security cameras and then motion lights, just like you would have at a residence on the garage so, front. So you're not going to have a, a pole, pole light that comes on at dusk and goes off no. in the morning? No. Okay. okay. Thanks, Ann. Thank you. Yep. Good night. Um, can, I, can I make a comment? Please. Um, as this was described, last week, this, uh, what, what I, I saw that we were being asked to, to allow a transition, that there were materials that were stored there now for the landscaping business that, that weren't going to be removed instantaneously, but rather between now and October, they would be removed. It, it, it was described as temporary storage. If, if instead we're talking about concurrently allowing two uses, 
to, to run the landscaping business and, and drop off new supplies and remove new supplies and have trucks come in and out while you're running your, your distribution business. I think that's a whole different understanding than I had. And, and I'm not, I'm not uh, inclined to approve that. I, I think a reasonable transition, we need to be very clear. And if Larry, if you think the findings aren't clear in that regard, maybe we need to tighten them up. But, but uh, I think we need to describe a, a, a reasonable phase out and, and not an operation of the landscaping business while we've sanctioned the new use and, and effectively disallowed the old use. Yeah, just for what it's worth, I haven't approved nor agreed to Mike dropping any new product off once I'm in the property. So he wouldn't be dropping anything else off there, only taking stuff away um, as, as needed or to remove it, but not, not dropping anything off. No, but I, I think the, the question that, that Ms. Campbell put forward, it, at least the light went on in my, in my head that said, hey, we didn't, maybe we didn't understand. And, and at a minimum, when, when we capture this in the findings, I think we need to be clear on what our understanding is, what it is we're giving approval for. So, so Ed, this is the way I wrote it up. Uh, so the continued use until the 1st of October, 2020 by current owner Corsi Holdings LLC of the site as temporary storage for landscape materials does not constitute approval of the site for two uses. This is a concession proposed by applicant to allow current owner to fully relocate to his new location elsewhere. I think that's so perfect. it's not dual use and it's just temporary storage as he moves materials away. And it's just material storage, right? No. Material no. storage, that's it. He's gonna take all his trucks and they're gonna go elsewhere. He won't be parking his trucks there overnight at all. They'll, they'll only come there if, he, if they need to pick up some of the rocks that were just delivered. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Storage of materials, that's it. No, you can't store machinery rocks. there. No, no storing machinery, equipment, all that kind of stuff. Materials. Thanks, Larry. That, that, that does it for me. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ed. Okay. So, any more uh, public hearing questions? Dave? Okay. Hi there, it's Lori Dowdy at 2 Hickory Lane again. Um, something I neglected to ask uh, before, is there going to be a dumpster on site um, or what kind of disposal um, plans are there for uh, for waste and for trash? And if there is going to be a dumpster, where exactly would it be located? Um, I don't anticipate out of the gates that there'll be a dumpster. Um, I don't see why I would be having a tremendous amount of waste because again, the, the products that are coming in are prepackaged um and then they're going into boxes and and being shipped out um so i i wouldn't imagine that i'm going to have a tremendous amount of waste other than a few trash cans of typical household waste um if i a point in time comes where a dumpster is needed i would certainly put it um out of sight um on the loading dock side behind the building as far away from Load as possible, and if an enclosure is needed for said dumpster, I'd be glad to uh, erect one. Um, but again, out of the gates, I don't anticipate needing any more, uh, you know, disposal other than a few trash cans um, that would have typical household waste. There's no food going in to the uh, to the trash. I hope there isn't. Again, if I'm throwing a tremendous amount of food away, I'm going to just go out of business anyway. So that would be a bad scenario. Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, yeah, nothing, uh, nothing that I'm concerning myself with, with a large amount of, of disposal, uh, initially. Um, and again, if it gets to a dumpster scenario, I would certainly put it out of, out of sight and enclosed if need be. So can I just jump in there, Larry? So the way I wrote this up is, um, 
Applicant confirmed that no hazardous or toxic substances will be stored on site or used in commercial activities on site. Dumpster on site will remain out of sight and will be for only everyday household trash. Okay, so that, that reflects really what's in the application. So if a dumpster is on site, it should be invisible to abutters, essentially, or at least, you know, hidden as much as possible. Is that right? Is that, is that okay, Mike? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Didn't know you were speaking to me. Yes, absolutely. That sounds good to me. Okay. So, Dave, how are we doing? Okay. Well, I think that I can close the public hearing then. So, in that case, I think we've all pretty talk well talked. Anybody that hasn't talked want to ask a question of Mike before we uh, we vote on this? Okay, I see nothing. So, what I need is a motion and a second. I'll make a motion to accept okay. application as, with restrictions as described. And, and I think Larry just okay. seconded it. I'll, I'll second, yeah. Okay, so. So, 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 hang, so, hang on, so, we're, so, so hang on, so we're closing the public hearing and we've accepted the application as complete and. Did that last time. The next step. No, we. So, we, so we we're ready to approve the application. Okay, is, good. All right. Which is what you just seconded. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I'm voting in favor. So Nina. I'll vote in favor. Okay. Ed. Yes. I'm Ed? sorry. I couldn't understand Nina. I said yes in favor. Thank you. Good. Aye. Okay. Larry? Uh, aye. And Scott? Aye. Okay. So it is approved. So, Larry, I believe you can read that magnificent finding of facts of yours, and then we'll have two things to sign. Thursday or Friday down with uh, with uh, Lisa. Okay. So. Should I go ahead and start then? Proceed, yes. Okay, so this is the uh, finding of facts in regard to the application for lobster and seafood distribution warehouse at 184 Beachwood Avenue, Kennebunkport, Maine, uh, 04046. So following the site plan reviews pursuant to the Kenny Bunkport land use ordinance held on the 3rd of June, 2020 and public hearings held on the 17th of June, 2020, the Kenny Bunkport planning board makes the following findings of facts and conclusions and renders the following decisions subject to the conditions enumerated below. The applicant is New Point LLC, 100 Oak Ridge Road, Kenny Bunkport, Maine, 04046, the property has a street address of 184 Beachwood Avenue, Kenny Bunkport, Maine, 04046. The property is identified as map 24 block one lot 14B on municipal tax assessor's maps. The owner of record of the property is Michael Corsi slash Corsi Holdings LLC, comma Stacy Corsi slash Corsi Holdings LLC. 128 Witten Hills Road, Kenny Bunkport, Maine, 04046. The property is located in the Farm and Forest Zone. The applicant represented himself during the proceedings. The applicant, in parentheses, buyer, has demonstrated a pending legal interest in the property by providing a copy of a purchase and sale agreement with, in parentheses, seller, Michael Corsi, slash Corsi Holdings LLC, comma Stacy Corsi slash Corsi Holdings LLC, stating that the property will be conveyed 
by a warranty deed upon closing in due course. The seller has demonstrated a legal interest in the property by providing a copy of a warranty deed recorded in York County Registry of Deeds, Book 16718, pages 510, 511, on the 23rd of October 2013, showing ownership by Corsi Holdings, LLC. The property comprises three acres more or less and has been used since October, since the 23rd of October, 2013 as a landscaping equipment warehouse. Before the 23rd of October, 2013, the property was permitted for use as a lobster and seafood distribution warehouse. Applicant proposes to again use the property as a lobster and seafood distribution warehouse. In an application dated 11th of May, 2020, applicant proposes to continue use of the existing buildings on the property in applicant's business as a wholesale distributor and broker of fresh and frozen seafood products. Applicant proposes to use property for receiving, repacking, warehousing, and distributed such fresh and frozen seafood products. No retail activities will occur on the site. Applicant proposes to remove existing cooler addition adjacent to the light industrial commercial building on site and to replace such cooler with a freestanding cooler and freezer unit. Because the land use ordinance lists fish processing and warehousing as conditional uses in the farm and forest zone, site plan review and approval by the planning board is required. In response to questions from abutters, applicant advised the board that facility initially we will be staffed by one employee owner, namely the applicant, from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday each week. In future, up to four employees may be on site. Growth of the business beyond a need for four employees would outgrow, outgrow constraints imposed by the size of the existing building and would require other arrangements. In response to questions from abutters, applicant advised the board that applicants' own small refrigerated van would be used in support of commercial activities at site. Deliveries rarely would be supplemented by tractor trailer sized truck. Distribution of packaged fish from site would also be by UPS during afternoon hours. Should trucks be on site for more than five minutes, engines will be turned off. Vegetation, which now is on site, will remain intact with the exception of three plants located on the north corner of the property, which need to be removed in order to eliminate interference with the leach field of the septic system on site. Applicant has requested no submission or performance waivers from the requirements of the Kenny Bunkport Land Use Ordinance. Pursuant to the requirements of Article 1010A of the Land Use Ordinance, guidelines for decisions, the planning board shall approve a site plan application unless it makes a negative ruling on one or more of the following identified findings, which would otherwise compel denial. 14A, the proposed use meets the definition or specific requirements set forth in the land use ordinance and will be in compliance with applicable state or federal laws finding yes. B, the proposed use will not create fire safety hazards and will provide adequate access to the site or to the buildings on the site for emergency vehicles, finding yes. C, the proposed exterior lighting will not create hazards to motorists traveling on adjacent public streets and is adequate for the safety of occupants or users of the site and will not damage the value and diminish the usability of adjacent properties, finding yes. D, the provisions for buffers and on-site landscaping provided, provide for adequate protection to neighboring properties from detrimental features of the property. Finding yes. E, the proposed use will not have a significant detrimental effect on the use and peaceful enjoyment of a budding property as a result of noise, vibrations, fumes, odor dust, glare, or other cause. Finding yes. Comments. This commercial facility abuts residential areas. The commercial facility is intended for weekday activities only between the hours of 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. Monday to Friday 
facilities shall include provisions for sound attenuation and noise abatement in order to limit noise polluting pollution emanating from the facility to EPA, NIOSH, and OSHA requirements, such as 85 decibels on the A scale for all workers during an eight-hour day, 55 decibels on the A scale measured at residential areas during the day, and 47 decibels on the A scale measured at residential areas during the night from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. F. The provision for vehicular loading and unloading and parking and for vehicular and pedestrian circulation on the site and onto adjacent public streets will not create hazards to safety finding. Yes. Comments. Facility previously was used in a related capacity as lobster and seafood distribution warehouse. Established access and parking areas for vehicles and pedestrian use remain in effect. G. The proposed use will not have a, de a significant detrimental effect on the value of adjacent properties, which could be avoided by reasonable modification of the plan. Finding yes, comments. Facility previously was used in a related capacity as lobster and seafood distribution warehouse. Facility will not be used to process seafood. Facility will be used only in the context of wholesale distribution and brokering of fresh and frozen seafood products. H, the design of the site will not result in significant flood hazards or flood damage and is in conformance with applicable flood hazard protection requirements. Finding yes, com comments, the property is not in a flood zone. I, adequate provision has been made for disposal of wastewater or solid waste and for the prevention of ground or surface water contamination. Finding yes, comments. Existing septic system has excess capacity. Four employees are planned. The septic is sized for up to 20 employees. Installation of a garbage grinder type disposal is not recommended without the addition of an additional 1,000 gallon septic tank or septic tank filter, filter installed upstream of the existing septic tank. J. Adequate provision has been made to control erosion or sedimentation. Finding yes. K. Adequate provision has been made to handle stormwater runoff or other drainage problems on the site. Finding yes. L. The proposed water supply will meet the demands of the proposed use or for fire protection purposes. Finding yes. M. Adequate provision has been made for the transportation, storage, and disposal of hazardous substances and materials as defined by state law. Um, I said this is not applicable. It's either that or yes. I have a comment. The comment is applicant confirmed that no hazardous or toxic substances will be stored on site or used in commercial activities on site. The dumpster on site will remain out of sight and will be for only everyday household trash. N. The proposed use will not have an adverse impact on significant scenic vistas or on significant wildlife habita habitat, nor will have such an impact that could be avoided by reasonable modifications of the plan. Finding yes. Comments. The proposed changes will not affect scenic vistas or significant wildlife habitat. O. Oh. The proposed use will not cause unreasonable highway or public road congestion. Finding yes. The comments, the proposed use will continue commercial activities, including deliveries and shipment of products. P, existing off-site ways and traffic facilities can safely and conveniently accommodate the increased traffic generated by the development as far away from the development as the effects of the development can be traced with reasonable accuracy. Yes, comments, the proposed, activity, the proposed changes will not increase traffic. Okay. So conclusions, Article 1010A of the Land Use Ordinance mandates that the planning board shall approve a site plan application unless it makes one or more identified findings that would otherwise compel denial. And as noted above, the board makes no such finding. Um, so decision, the site plan application identified above is hereby approved. And conditions. Conditions of approval, if any, pursuant to Article 10.11 and 10.12e. Number one, first condition. 
Pursuant to Article 10.11, the Planning Board attaches the following conditions to the approval of the application. A, the existing woodland buffers must be maintained. B, the facility's level of use as described above, particularly in paragraphs 10, 11, 12, 14 point E and 14 point I, must not be increased. C, approvals are contingent upon applicant's successful conclusion of purchase and sale agreement dated 28th of April, 2020. Should the applicant not complete purchase of property, approvals will revert, will revert to those of landscaping equipment warehouse. D, continued use until the 1st of October, 2020 by the current owner, Corsi Holdings LLC, of the site as temporary storage for landscape materials does not constitute approval of the site for two uses. This is a concession proposed by applicant to allow current owner to fully re relocate to new location elsewhere. Two, the applicant pursuant to 10.12.E shall notify the planning board prior to the transfer of rights to construct an approved project. Three, the applicant must record a copy of this decision and provide proof of such recordation in the York County Registry of Deeds before any permits may issue or before any construction activities may commence. Four, the applicant shall compel all terms and conditions comply with, sorry, applicant shall comply with all terms and conditions of the Town of County Bunkport Ordinance as well as the main DEP approvals dated the 17th of June, 2020. That's it. Move for approval of the findings of fact as read. Second. Okay, so we're gonna go through the uh, approval list of people again. So I'm in favor of this uh, FOF. Nina? Say it again, I'm sorry. Aye. Okay, good. Ed? Aye. Larry? Aye. Scott? Aye. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. So, Mike, thank you. Uh, we'll we'll uh, sign this finding of facts over the next couple of days at, at Town Hall, and then you have to take and get it uh, recorded. Okay, great. Uh, I have a, just a quick question for uh, Larry. Is this, um, so what you read, that was uh, draft version two, correct? Yes, this one, well, no, this is the final. It doesn't have a, it doesn't have a watermark on it. This okay. This is the final version. All right, yeah, just checking. So I know which yeah. one I'm printing. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, the next and final item for the evening is the Kenny Bug Port is item, let's see, do it right. Item 200203, Kenny Bug Port Heritage Housing Trust, Sebago Techniques, Authorized Agent, Preliminary Subdivision, Public Hearing for approval to create four lots containing two single family dwellings, two duplex units, and a 4.47 acre. Parcel of Main Street, Assessor's Tax Map 22, Block 9, Lot 21 in the Cape Corpus West Zone. And now we need to bring Steve Doe into the picture. So Dave, can you find Mr. Doe? And there he is. How you doing? Okay. So, Steve, why don't you uh, sort of present everything again, a bit again, and maybe address a few of the butter comments we've gotten uh, sure. so far, and then we'll be opening it up after after you've uh, spoken. And I don't know if uh, another member of the trust wants to speak before that. Or, or uh, 
or perhaps Ralph, but we'll start with you. <laughs> okay, yeah. So um, just for the record, I'm Steve Doe, landscape architect with Sebago Technics and representing the Kenny Bunkport Heritage Housing Trust too. Um, at the last meeting, uh, the board had asked us to provide um, some responses to the letter from uh, um, Kenneth Olson. Um, Olson dated June 3rd. Um, so on June 10th, we submitted a, a letter through Warner's office um, addressing their five uh, comments. Um, I think it's pretty clear what, you know, I can go through those if you'd like um, or answer any questions you have on that letter. Um, a couple other things um, before I go into the presentation. Um, we have received two main DOT permits, entrance permits for both the uh, proposed road and the driveway cuts uh, for the lots one and two. And then I know Nina had concerns about the birds and the windows. Um, and we confirmed um, that all the, the windows are double hung and they will have full screens on, on the outsides of those. Um, and I guess with that, um, I see I got a share screen um, image here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, if it's all right, I'll go through the, the plan um, for the public and um, take it from there, I guess. That sound reasonable? Yeah. Dave, can you share his screen? All right, let's see. Can you see that? All right. Oh, here we go. I found it. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through some of the documents that are on the town's. Um, website, which everybody has access to. And I'm going to focus primarily on this uh, lot grading plan that really gives an overview of the project. Um, and this is the plan I looked at, we looked at last time we were in front of the board. Um, so what this shows is the four lots starting on uh, the far side here is lot one, which has a, a single family residence on it. Septic field is proposed in the back. This is a 20,000 square foot lot, um, slightly over, but the net residential area is 20,000 square feet. As a common driveway that comes in, two parking spaces for this unit. This common drive also serves lot two, uh, which will have the duplex on it. Um, and their septic system is located in the rear. <clears throat> there is a slight impact to a wetland right here. Um, and then both of these will be served by public water, uh, which is across Route 9 here. So we'll have two lines that come across here to serve these two units, and another line that comes over to serve this unit. And then as we move down, um, this area right here is where the existing skating rink and parking area is. Um, so we're bringing a new road in. So we'll have a hammerhead turnaround, um, which will provide access for lots three and lot four. A public water main will start um, across Route 9. It's be a two-inch line. will come in and serve um, the duplex unit on lot three and the lot on lot and the, the unit on lot four. Um, this front lot will have a septic system located here. And then the back lot will have a septic system located in the rear there. Um, there'll be a small um, detention area located right in here, uh, which is actually utilizing the um, berm of the uh, ice skating rink as kind of the backdrop for that basin. And that will collect water that's coming from, uh, on this plan view anyway, coming from the west 
that will flow in this direction. It'll capture the road and then take it through a pipe and then it'll detain it in this basin here before outletting into the, into the wetland by the stream. Um, there is a open space area located back here, which has access off the end of the hammerhead. Access is, is going to be this direction. Um, it's really just going to be passive open space. We're not proposing any improvements at this time. So um, it's really, it meets the minimum, actually it meets more than the minimum requirements um, for subdivisions. Um, I think with that, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I really don't have anything else to add unless the board has questions for me or Ralph. Steve, one question. This is Ed. The, the last time, I think it was said that each of the homes, each of the families would have their own uh, septic tank and there would be a common leach field for the duplexes. And, and I'm only seeing one septic for the sh shared by the two by the duplexes here. This so this is the, this is the septic field. So there is one septic field per unit. I'm showing one septic tank, but the HHE 200 overrides that, and um, I don't I don't have a copy of that with me right here. Um, but that if that's the way the design called for, they they have one per unit. Yeah, I don't I don't need to see the drawing marked up. I just wanted to confirm that what I heard last time was correct that there was just the shared field and each had its own tank. I believe that is my understanding, but I can confirm that, you know. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> no, he, why don't we bring Ralph in? That's fine. He's part of the presentation, so that's fine. And you can take Steve's picture down, probably. Good evening. Hi, Ralph. Hi. I'm just here along to answer any questions that the board might have that uh, relate more to the legal end than uh, the technical for Steve. Well, I have a question about finances. Uh, it's come up in Mr. Olson's letter. Oh, for something we you normally ask for a bond. The question is, you know, uh, how how is the Heritage Trust going to guarantee um, the finances around this for not just the construction of houses but the construction of the roads and everything that has to be prepared um i think we need to step back for a second what what the board is going to be if it approves uh is the division of land you're not approving the construction of the houses um under the subdivision regulations the board does have to have, or the applicant does have to have the financial capability and has to provide performance guarantees for required improvements. Under the subdivision regs, the required improvements are uh, the roads, um, any sidewalks or curbing, if there's any um, utilities, the, the septic and, and the water. Um, and so as part of this process, when we get to final, we will have mm -hmm for the performance guarantee. But that doesn't relate to the construction of the houses. Okay, so the performance guarantee will be basically for all of the roads, the septic systems, everything else. If I could clarify it, it doesn't include the septics, it would really be the road and the water main that goes into it, any improvements in the road, but not improvements on the lots themselves. Um, it would cover the detention basin 
and the storm drain for that. Yeah, I stand corrected. Steve's correct on that. Help, help me, Ralph. I, I understand that typically the developer is, is taking care of developing the property and then individual homeowners are responsible for improving the lots and, and constructing their, their house. Here where we've got shared um, septics, for example, uh, it, it seems like that model ha has a flaw in it. Wouldn't the septics be included as part of the developer's oversight and, and funding purview? It, it would be for the individual lots when the lots are being created. Correct. But it's, yeah. So when they would build, say, one of the duplex lots, if I don't know if they're having if they're building both duplexes at the same time, but they would have to install that septic system with that particular lot. And again, that would be the housing trust who would come forward with that development project. They, they're constructing the houses, not the mortgagee. Right, and that would go through the building, you know, codes office. Right, that would be part of the building permit application process to um, to provide. Uh, Warren with the information he needs to know that the septic will be constructed properly. I, I have a bit of confusion that just generated by hearing this, this talk. Now, a duplex, what normally would happen in the real world would be that somebody would build the duplex and then sell the hat, the other, sell one or two halves. Now, in this case, you're saying that, that the that the future owner is the mortgagee to build the duplex, but you got to have two, it takes two to tango to build the duplex. So it's like combined, these two people have to be mortgaging at the same time to, it, it's a little confusing if, uh, how that works exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, I presume, well, I don't know. I, I don't know what the trust plans are uh, and if any of the trust members can, can join in um, as far as when they construct a duplex, I, I presume they're constructing both at the same time. Um, but um, we would set the uh, documentation up such that uh, they could be financed separately. Obviously though, the shared elements would, would not be financed separately. Or half half each? Yeah, I mean, the way it would typically be in a, in a situation like that is um, the first person in may have to pay for all of it and then get reimbursement from the second person in. And that's not unusual. I mean, some of the subdivisions we've done recently uh, where, for example, there's a shared driveway access and shared utility access, uh, the lot that uh, is built on uh, pays for the cost of the road and the utilities coming in and gets reimbursed by when the second house goes up. Pinnacle Hill is an example of that. Okay. So any other questions before we uh, open up the uh, public hearing at this point? I, I believe you had Pat Clancy. I thought I saw raise, uh, raise okay. his hand as a member of the trust. Good. Let's hear Pat. Before, before we go to the public hearing. No, he's not, but he's part of the trust. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, you know, very simply to the question of the duplex, we would have um, two homeowners um, identified with mortgage commitments, um, with purchase and sale agreements, with the demarcation of the, you know, the apportionment, if you will, of, of uh, you know, that goes with any duplex arrangement uh, in here, including uh, the septic field. Um, worked out to the mortgage lender's satisfaction um, and would proceed 
uh, at, to, to do uh, to order those uh, two homes built uh, at the same time um, for each duplex. What if you only have one? We proceed with the duplex until we had two. Could you hear me? I have another question, comment for Steve. Steve, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, you, I think only in part answered some of the requests that I had. And um, there was quite a bit that you didn't address. First, double hung windows may have screens on them, but as we've heard before in other applications, people take screens off. And one of the suggestions I made was that bird-friendly glass doesn't cost so much now as it did when it was first put out. In fact, it's quite comparable to regular window glass. And I suggested that the bird-friendly glass be put into these houses. This is an opportunity basically to teach people coming into Kenny Bunkport how important it is to surroundings about them. And in conjunction with that, uh, you treatment of lawns and how much lawn there could be. Um, we have lost something like 70% of birds, 75% of insects. Lighting at night has reduced the firefly population and other insect populations considerably because natural lighting out And I think those sort of things and understanding why they're restricted should be written into the lease agreement. And I didn't hear anyone yet address that, nor address construction so that you had either bird-friendly overhangs or bird-friendly glass. You're expecting sometimes to have families move into these duplexes. And we have people coming from other states which are very urban or suburbia and they know nothing about the natural surroundings of Maine. And we're losing our natural surroundings and our wildlife at a great rate, a very fast rate. And I think anything we can do to help people to understand why we put restrictions on things, putting restrictions first, and then why we put restrictions on things helps the next generation to maintain Maine the way it should be. If this is going to be town controlled or heritage trust controlled, I think we can control our environment a little bit. So I would like to see those things. I, I got some of those. You're, you're kind of going in and out. Um, so I, just kind of reiterating what I heard. Um, you were concerned about the, the screens and not being kept on and maybe being taken off. And so we should check in the bird friendly glass. Um, I got bits or of bird friendly Or bird friendly design. Bird friendly glass or design, okay. Um, and then I, didn't get the next one, but I'm assuming it's relating to fertilizers and organic use or no fertilizers because of the stream. And, and I think I agreed to that last time. Yeah. We talked about yeah. that and, you know, making a note either in the plan and also in the, uh, uh, the covenants, I think the homeowners the, documents. The homeowners, the lease is sort of what the, co the sort of the covenants, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
And then the rest of it, I really didn't, it was kind of broken up. Um, I, I understood about make, educating uh, the people that are coming in, assuming they're from out of state or out of town. I think the goal is to get people that are more local, um, but again, making them aware of the environment and you know what, what we're all about over here. why we restrict pesticides. I think these are things that are easily written into a lease. They don't cost any, and they help people to understand how we keep the environment together to maintain it. Yep, I agree. Your goal. And I think it's, you know, helping them to understand why we maintain that is very important. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um. So I guess. Uh, Am I still? Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yes. Pat. Okay. Um, uh, so you know, just to add to what Steve said, I think that we, we are certainly prepared to incorporate the um, the the uh, continued continuous use of the screens as well as um, uh, restrictions on pesticides and fertilizers um, in the lease, as you uh, uh, suggest, Nina. Um, I did inquire, um, you know, again, we're working very hard to make these homes as cost effective as we can. I did inquire of uh, uh, our builder whether the glass manufacturer made a, uh, a more bird friendly product. This particular glass manufacturer does not. And the glass manufacturer is the one regularly used by the um, the modular facility that we'll be doing. So to switch manufacturers would, would be a cost to us. And I think for this, that that's, you know, that, that, that we can't afford that. We also have a very simple and, and I think attractive, but simple design and to introduce overhangs would both be a cost and would also, I think, be an aesthetic detraction from the nature of the design that we have. So, you know, we are prepared to incorporate a provision for use of screens we are prepared, and in fact, we'll reach out to you when we're doing it um, to make sure that our educational process with homeowners, which is a, a requirement for first time home buyers um, around kind of, you know, um, uh, financial obligations, but that that is more extensive in terms of environmental elements as well. Um, and, uh, and to incorporate uh, some of the things that you've described in, in what we communicate and try to raise the consciousness, even if the, even if the, our buyers are in fact local. I understand that. Um, have you even inquired into uh, bird friendly design on the houses? It seems to me that if you had started, and I suggested long time ago that you look into bird friendly designs that your architect could basically investigate various ways to incorporate that into the houses. Now you have a plan, but nobody has seems to have looked into this at all. And so excuse well, we, me if know, I'm a little bit peeved. About yeah, um, I, I, I will. I mean, we haven't, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to comply with the existing requirements. I understand this is an area where the requirements may expand over time. But as of now, we're certainly working to comply and you know, we have been working with, a, um, I think, an, an architect that, uh, you know, that has done work in Kennebunkport extensively, Caleb Johnson, that is, you know, a, a sensitive designer. And, um, uh, you know, um, we will continue to do so. But um, uh, I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I think 
incorporating into the lease uh, use of the screens and uh, re restrictions on pesticides and fertilizers is, is where we're at. Okay, are we, uh, anybody else uh, have comments from the board before we uh, open up for a public hearing? Yes, Tom, Tom this is Ed. Uh, just, yeah. just a comment. Um, I, I think it's great that the, that the trust is, is going to uh, do what it can within the the budget and the and the model that they have in place to to look at adding certain constraints to the homeowner agreement. But I, I want to just ask the board to consider that if we are talking about expanding the requirements on this subdivision to prohibit certain fertilizers and to require certain education. Um, certain types of design to accommodate wildlife and birds and and the like if we're doing that i think we're making a commitment to doing that going forward for all subdivisions i don't think we want to send a signal that says that uh, affordable housing tenants require extra guidance and, and constraints with regard to uh, education and uh, the like that they may not know as much about Maine. I think we want to do something that we are willing to levy uniformly on new homes built in Kennebunkport in new subdivisions. It's, and and it's if we're doing that, I think we're talking about uh, changing the subdivision regulations. Okay. I just want to say as, as far as the organic fertilizers and pesticides that has showed up in every set the last several subdivisions they've all said that I mean it's all been fairly standard stuff in the the in the stuff for the binnacle hills and the and you know so this last several the developers all put that right into the the data so it's not like we're asking for something that no one's ever asked for before, but it's like something that's been appearing all by voluntary from from the developers. So. And I think it's it's appropriate to share that to share that history uh, with with each applicant and and to ask for their compliance. And I think that's that's what we've heard here. In fact, what I just heard was was an additional constraint on the screens to require them to stay in place something we haven't done in the past. Mm. So, so I think this voluntary compliance is a great way to go forward. I think these are, these are good practices, but, but levying them um, on a case by case basis, I think puts us in jeopardy and I think it's unfair. So just think about well, it. The reason that I Can't, can't hear a thing. This is something that other subdivisions have private developers. The trust basically is a corporation, or not a corporation, yeah, 501c3 corporation that's been set up to help the town. <laughs> put in affordable housing. And so I think we can require there. As far as changing the subdivision regulations, I would be absolutely in favor of setting out further regulations that require every single new building in Kenny Bunkport to be bird friendly and any renovations to be bird friendly, whether it be <coughs> being the Toronto do that. I think we could do that. We, I we think could. I only got about half of what you said, Dana. 
we we yeah. could change the subregs conceivably because they're, they're they're within our control to say from this point fit for from the time that the subreg is changed forward that's not a problem as far as every building that that you just said that that would require the land use ordinance which would have to be approved by everybody in the town so that's a, a whole lot <laughs> different well uh I don't think it's so expensive these days to plan ahead to protect birds as we're losing them at a great rate. And I think it's one of the things that make any bunk port so rich in diversity of wildlife to have all the birds around. And I'm seeing fewer and fewer of them as are other people. Did that come through? It if did. I switch over to if, if if I switch over to my Well, Nina, it, you said if you, I switch over to my, and then we heard nothing after that. I said, if I switch over to my hotspot, I lose sound. Did that come through? Yes. Portion of it came through. Okay. So. Anyway. Nina, it may be useful if you turn your video off. It may give you a little more bandwidth. I have tried that in the past, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Good. Good. <laughs> All right. Shall we proceed to the public hearing? Any more uh, comments from the board or from the, the trust? Well, uh, I, I just, this is Larry. I just had a, a comment. I, I kind of wanted to reinforce Nina's thoughts. And um, really, uh, and, you know, it's reassuring to know that there's a, a, a well-experienced architect at work on this project, but um, um, the inclusion, the consideration of provisions for health, environment, and safety uh, topics at the outset of design, uh, properly configured, can actually save money. So, I'm a little, I'm a little reluctant to just give in and say, okay, having bird protected glass is going to be too expensive. I'm not so sure. Um, there, I don't know exactly uh, what what other savings could accrue, but um, I think it'd be worthwhile uh, for a, a, you know, a serious look at what the actual impact would be to include all of well, these various provisions in the, in the design. And, um, you know, if those provisions are included early, many times you could save money. You, you just think about it a, a little bit. So even though this particular project might be a deviation or actually, sorry, even though including things like bird friendly glass in this project might be a deviation from what the architect is used to doing. Um, I think it'd be well worth the time uh, to see what, what's the actual impact. And are, and are there other savings that could accrue because of that? So anyway, that's my, that's my two cents. Okay, this is a preliminary, a, uh preliminary submission, which the end result of that is a letter from, from me expressing the comments of the board against the plan. Once we, we say it's, it's good, basically, that would include the, you know, when we see it in the final, we want to see these things, A, B, C. And we could, again, ask them to just once again, address the subject of bird-friendly glass. Beyond, yeah, beyond. 
If I might, Mr. Chairman, make a comment, please. Um, and we'll certainly the trust. You know, we'll talk about some of these issues. Um, I agree with Ed Francis that. Well, first of all, you're not you're not approving the design or construction of houses. Um, that follows the zoning ordinance and the building code. We're, the trust is more than willing to work with the board to incorporate some of these issues uh, into uh, the project. We think a requirement <clears throat> that there be screens more than goes halfway to meeting the concerns. Um, so I, we will discuss this, but I, I just don't want the board to think that we're gonna go out and redesign the houses. Um, certainly something to look at. Well, just, just to clarify, I think you led me to believe earlier, as I reinforced my belief that we're approving the subdivision, the division of the properties and, and any constraints on what type of development is allowed on those properties. <clears throat> So for example, we could in approving the preliminary or the final say um, that yes, you, you, this property will, will only be allowed to use organic fertilizers, for example, even though the lawns aren't being approved yet and where they're exactly they're gonna go and the houses aren't being built. So, so we could, um, if, if we thought it was right, add a stipulation that said only houses that met some federal guideline for, for bird friendliness would be allowed there. That, that's how we'd have to go about it because we're not approving the house design at this juncture. That, that is correct. Is that fair? That's fair. I, uh, there's only so far that, a, and I don't wanna get into a big debate on this um, because we wanna try and work with the board but there are parameters on how far you can go on restrictions or conditions that don't really relate to the division of the land. I have no problem with the organic fertilizer because that's something that relates directly to uh, runoff um, and issues like that. Um, I, I agree with you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not of a mind that said that the board can change the subdivision regu re regulations subject to no review other than their own with any requirement that they decide is right. Like if we decided all the houses had to be blue, we could change the subdivision regs to say that. I don't think we would be allowed to do that. I don't think that would stand. I think this bird friendliness is, uh, is a lot more important than the color of the houses. It, it is something I would support, but I would like to see it subject to town review and not something that could unilaterally be done by the planning board. I think our job needs to be, needs to follow from the existing law. And right now I don't see that. Okay. Um, assuming I've got no more comments from the board, I'm going to ask the public for the first, uh, Public hearing, could uh, someone uh, raise their hand? Yes, I was expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> Not a huge surprise. No. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, as you know, I submitted a second letter with concerns after the preliminary hearing, and, and I don't intend to go through any of those today. I, I just ask that the uh, the planning board really give all of that information kind of extra due diligence. Um, you know, I recognize that people are talking about um, subdivisions and, and creating systems that will apply in the future to other subdivisions, but this is really a very unique situation. Um, this is a plan or a project that has essentially been conceived by the Board of Selectmen, approved by the Board of Selectmen, and pushed by the Board of Selectmen before it came to the planning board. So, you know, it really doesn't leave us a lot of recourse to make sure that we're heard. 
um, and it's kind of a very frustrating process. Um, for me as a direct abutter to the property, the first time I heard about this project was when I was asked to make a donation to it. Um, and, and that's that's really unacceptable. Um, and and I'm concerned going forward that if that's if that's the level of of communication that we're going to get from the housing trust, um, this is this is really going to be uh, problematic. So, um, I ask that you you know provide all due diligence to this. Um, I, I'd like to comment on a couple of things that were in the letter that uh, Steve submitted. In response, I, I don't think my questions were adequately answered. Um, so two different areas. One is is the financial ability. Um, that was kind of dismissed out of hand by Steve, saying it wasn't uh, under the purview of the planning board. Um, but my understanding after reading through the application packet and looking at the things that you need to check off on, um, you, you actually need to, uh, you know, identify whether or not the person or the entity will be able to have the, the, the financial capability and the technical capability um, to do this project. So um, I don't think that exists. And, and I outlined a lot of those issues within, um, within the letter I sent. Um, just so you know, in terms of my background, uh, why I'm so vociferous about this, so passionate, um, I, I currently consult the nonprofits. Um, I was an executive director for 35 years to nonprofits that provided residential services. Uh, the last one I did, we had uh, approximately 70 different residential services. So I'm very much aware of the costs that go into these things um, and the level of oversight and management that's concerned. Um, you know, I'm not even sure that this has been appropriately handled by the town at this point. Um, I, I don't see how it works as a model. Um, my estimate, looking at it roughly, is you could have $100,000 in administrative cost by your second year of doing this, given the things that you're asking the trust to do um, just with the lease agreements. So it, it's going to be a very expensive project to run. It doesn't seem viable to me. I don't even know how they're going to put the infrastructure in place on the land when they haven't done any fundraising since last year. Um, and, and don't seem to have much in the way of, of cash on hand. Um, you know, it, it's uh, part of what I mentioned too, is, is that, you know, the underlying goal of this seems to be to keep the consolidated school open. Um, and as I read through um, all of the information that's been listed um, in terms of that lease agreement, it really seems like we're almost taking advantage of the low income potential buyers rather than providing them with an opportunity and, and uh, you know, I hope those concerns will be addressed by the town and the, the board of selectmen. Um, so uh, the wetlands issue is, is the one that I really wanted to uh, bring up because um, it was kind of dismissed out of hand. Um, Steve mentioned in his letter um, that James Logan of Longview Partners had mapped the wetlands. Um, first, there's there's no mention of that in in um, in James's report. I don't see anything listed about the wetlands. Uh, second, uh, James Logan is a soil scientist. He is not a wetland scientist, um, so he's not licensed or certified to provide that opinion. Um, I'd ask that somebody who has that kind of a background be called to do that. Um, also, the two letters that they submitted with their application, one from the Maine Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, they recommended that a significant vernal pool survey be conducted. Um, I'd ask if that has been completed. And the Maine Department of Agriculture and Conservation um, asked uh, or recommended that a field survey for rare and exemplary botanical features be conducted. And I don't see either of those with the application process uh, <coughs> that was submitted. <coughs> The other, the last thing that I've, I'd like to, to ask, I guess, about the, uh, the wetlands piece or that was part of that report is that um, when they're talking about the property itself, it seems like there's a, a significant layer of bedrock, a very short amount um, underneath the soil. And the word blasting is mentioned numerous times throughout that report. Um, and I'm wondering if that's going to be part of the process and what impact that would have on abutting properties. Dave, can you uh, comment? Yeah, um, I'm gonna, uh, on the financial piece, I would refer to Pat 
Clancy on that, but I'll go through the other issues that <clears throat> um, Ken talked about. <clears throat> so as far as the, uh, the wetlands, even though Jim Logan is a soil scientist, he also does wetlands. That's very common that soil scientists um, do wetland mapping. Um, part of the identifications of wetlands is knowing the soil types, uh, whether are hydric soils, uh, vegetation, um, and, and Jim's very qualified to do that. And he but has hey, mapped the wetlands out there. That's that's um, not what's indicated online. Um, if you look at who's qualified to do that, he doesn't have the certifications to do wetlands mapping. That's the first I've heard of it because I've known Jim for many years and he's he's done wetlands as many years as I've known him. And the is, boards have accepted his work. Exactly. Well, maybe improperly so. Well, I would disagree with that, but um, as far as vernal pools, Jim also does vernal pools and he did not identify any vernal pools on the property. Uh, I am aware that the letter from uh, Inland Fisheries did note that, uh, but that's a standard item that they have because they don't have data on every property as far as vernal pools. So that the, is uh, the satellite, the satellite map of the picture clearly please, shows there's a vernal pool. Yeah, Mr. Olson, please let him yes. finish. So, um, with a vernal pool, you have to have a wetland component. And I did look at that image that you sent um, that is not a vernal pool, that it's clearly an upland area. And the dark area that's shown in that is actually the shade from a pine tree. Um, I've walked that land. I've never seen any area there that would be a vernal pool. Um, hey, I, I live next door, walk it every day with my dog, and it's filled with water a significant portion of the spring. That doesn't necessarily indicate it's a vernal pool. There's other requirements just other than standing water. So perhaps the survey should be done. It's adjacent to a wetland. I can talk to Jim and I know he's already looked at it and we can get some sort of a, uh, a letter from him discussing the vernal pools. Um, as far as the rare plants, um, that was also stated in the main natural areas program. I did look at the list of plants and um, the, they have a list of plants in their letter which are identified as the rare plants. And this site does not have those conditions that those plants would live in. Um, if you read that list, they are all coastal wetlands, um, open fields. Um, the site doesn't have that environment to, to support that plant life. Um, and then as far as the blasting, um, the town does have a blasting ordinance and any development that happens on these will have to conform to that blasting ordinance. As far as the uh, financial situation, that is something that is done in the final plan, not in the preliminary plan. So that, that would be something that they would submit with the final plan for us to, uh, to look at and determine its uh, veracity. I, know, I keep coming back to the financial ability. And you didn't listen to what I just said either, did you? Nope. Oh. So we'll see the financial ability in the final plan, assuming that we approve the preliminary plan. Uh, if I can just I'll, I'll add a little piece uh, regarding process, because you know, for some, uh, you know, it may not be clear, you know. You know, when we're referring to a preliminary plan and a final plan, you know, what exactly that means. Uh, so just so that, uh, you know, folks know and recognize that a preliminary plan application is exactly that. It's a preliminary plan. Uh, and uh, as the board has done in the past, they make it clear to applicants that, you know, that they, they don't gain any particular vested rights, you know, uh, relative to, you know, the planning board signing off on a, uh, a preliminary plan approval. 
Uh, it essentially allows them to move forward to the next step in terms of filing for the for the final plan approval. Um, you know, so right now the purpose is essentially to vet some of the big questions. Uh, you know, which is what you know, which is what the board is doing right now. You know, you're vetting some of the big questions uh, that you know that the trusts uh, will need to go back and address. Uh, but just to reiterate, you know, the um, financial uh, financial capacity component questions are, are, you know, the specifics are all typically addressed and, you know, that information gets provided in the final plan application, uh, you know, of which, you know, not only does the board review, uh, but the ta uh, town manager as well as myself review uh, and in ensure that uh, there's adequate funds relative to the to the required improvements for any subdivision plan. Uh, Process-wise, after that, you know uh, what occurs is that the applicant or the developer sets aside funds uh, in an escrow uh, that is managed by the town, uh, in which we hire a third-party. Uh, engineering firm to come out and do inspections for the required improvements uh, as they're as they're being constructed and only after we get a, a satisfactory report from that third party engineering firm do we sign off on any uh, reductions you know in the uh, in the letter of credit uh, or or any of the um, uh, financial documents that are required uh, and again, that's that's a process that the board doesn't necessarily see, uh, but that's you know, you know, functionally that's how that works. You know, after you know, after we go through uh, a subdivision process. And, and I guess I I do understand that piece. Um, the reason I'm I'm choosing to express those concerns in this forum, is while I um, I, I certainly appreciate the fact that you and the town manager. We'll be reviewing all the financial information. I, I, you know, and I'll do respect, it doesn't sit easy with me that you're also ex officio members of the housing trust. So it, it really seems like a significant conflict of interest that you're going to be approving your own budget. Uh, you know, and no, I, I can I can understand the question. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's something that, um, you know, I mean, we're a small community. And so, you know, we draw on, you know, the resources that we have at hand uh, you know, and, you know, when, when we do look at, you know, the estimates that are put forward, you know, we ask for actual estimates that come from, you know, that come from, you know, that, that don't just come from uh, a, a planning document. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't set up, uh, you know, a developer's budget, uh, you know, in terms of estimating what the costs of the infrastructure or improvements are. You know, when it comes time to, you know, before we, you know, before we sign off on on them getting started, you know, we're looking for the actual estimate that's coming out from, you know, from contractors who are going to be doing the work, uh, and and that's the those are the numbers that we, you know, that we look at, and those are the numbers that, you know, that get relied upon, uh, and those are also numbers that, you know, get signed off, uh, you know, by the bank as well, you know, that's uh, that's providing the funds. In this in this unique situation where potentially the trust or the the responsibility for the trust could fall back to the town, is that a consideration that's that's looked at? I mean, next year's budget, my understanding is we're already looking at a six hundred and fifty thousand dollar revenue shortfall. Um, to add this level of risk on top of that seems unwise. I mean, I, I can't I can't speak to that particular piece, you know, because that you know that piece is outside of you know that's outside of my purview and it's if i might add it's also outside the planning board i mean again the planning board is approving the division of land there are certain things it can look at certain conditions it can impose um but just as with any developer if, if ralph austin developer proposes a subdivision the board doesn't say well, Ralph, what's your plan if you go belly up? I mean, if I have the financial capacity, the performance guarantee to put the uh, improvements in, that's a protection for the town that those required improvements will be put in. Um, you don't inquire of, of developers, what's your plan B if, if you can't make it? 
you require the developer up front to have a performance guarantee for the required improvements. But that doesn't include the houses on the subdivision. It includes the roads and, and uh, you know, the water line going in and, and similar requirements like that. And it was a technical question, um, but it, this is not a private development. This is the town that's doing this development, essentially. So it would fall back on the town. It's a different situation entirely. But outside the planning board jurisdiction. Okay, um, so do you have any other comments? Uh, or shall we see who else might might uh, wish to talk? Are there any other hands raised, Dave? Okay. So, Tom, who is who is D on the on the participants on the panelists? <laughs> if, if this was not a Zoom meeting, but we were holding this as, as we used to, we would know. I don't think it's an unreasonable question. Okay, let's uh, recognize Mr. Mr. Kling. Also a member of the uh, trust. Yeah, Sorry. That, that might be me at double dipping. <laughs> <laughs> no, just uh, over volunteer. <laughs> All right, it's clearly an efficiency thing then. Yeah. Thank you, David. Okay, well, so we've only we only really got uh, public comments from one abutter, and he's since sent in a whole other letter for us to consider, which uh, just came in prior to this meeting. So it's uh, not for this meeting. So are we uh, at a point of? Uh, of closing the public hearing at this point. Anybody? Uh... You know, I think in the past, uh, Werner, there was a concern of uh, Amy that we, uh, on a Zoom meeting, maybe we continue the public hearing in case there are other comments. And I don't, uh, seeing only one person on, on it, uh, um, that's that's correct. Um, you know, it, it had been Amy's recommendation that to you know to allow for you know full due process that uh, you know that the that the board you know continue its public hearing over the course of two meetings. Uh, you know, it's not that we would necessarily hold a separate uh, meeting, but it was you know a recommendation that we uh, hold it hold it over two. So this is a fairly significant one. Perhaps we should. Just continue this to July 1st, but in the meantime, kind of uh, deliberate about what, what what I'm going to put in my letter to them that says, yeah, we've approved it and these concerns are out there on the part of our planning board for you to address in the final. I mean, that would that would be typical of what you've done before in the past. Yeah. So uh, why don't we, I, I'm going to suggest we, at this point, we uh, continue the public hearing to the next meeting and I will uh, try to put together a draft of my letter that we'll, uh, we'll discuss after closing the public hearing on July 1st. We'll do this first thing July 1st. So uh, I guess I need a, I, I'll make a motion to continue the meeting till one July. I, 
I, I was going to continue into the next time. If someone someone has their hand up. Okay. How about D call in and identify themselves anyway? D, are you there? Yes, this is Eric Johnson and Butter across the street. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> Better known as a D. Okay. It created its own shortcut. Yes. Um, question is, has there been any plans to uh, traffic studies in regards to the traffic speed across throughout this neighborhood? Yes or no? Um, we have not done a traffic study. Um, what we have done is submitted to the main department of transportation who controls um, access to that road um, entrance permits. Um, so they look at where the entrances are. They look at site distance. They know the posted speeds and um, we have received permits for both those driveways. Okay, the posted speed is relative to the actual speed throughout here. On a daily basis, traffic goes by here at 50, 60 miles an hour. I don't know if anybody is aware of that. Is, is the posted speed limit not 25? Yes, it is. Okay, I, 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 I got a warning on it once, that's why I asked. But I was only going 35, so <laughs> I wasn't going 50. Do you think it would be reasonable to put a, uh, a metering device out there to track what the speeds are actually going by here at this, at this time? Mm -hmm. Would that not be part of a traffic study? I think that's an enforcement issue for the town if they're going beyond that. I mean, a traffic it's study is going to look. Pardon? It's police stations right there, too. So you know. that doesn't matter. <laughs> Tractor trailers go by here at 50, 60 miles an hour daily. I mean, I think your, uh, our aunt almost got killed out here in front turn, trying to turn into the driveway and was caused was accused of being the fault of the accident when the other party in the accident admitted to doing at least 40 miles an hour. Traffic flies through here. I think what Steve was starting to say was that a traffic study doesn't, you know, that analyzes the number of trips and what's needed for that. It doesn't focus on whether people are speeding. Is that correct, Steve? Correct. Doesn't, it doesn't look at, at speeds, or as far as people speeding. Yeah, and a traffic analysis wouldn't be required under the subdivision regs um, unless there were more than 200 vehicles a day. Is my battery's running out, or is yours? Uh, Eric, Eric, this is in. What, what are you thinking that the traffic um, study would, would, uh, true, would um, potentially result in? If you want to disconnect and reconnect with yeah, that. Yeah, I may. I may. Or I'll just bring up my laptop for you. Thank you. My battery's running low. I was just going to convert over to my phone. Anyway, Ed, were you were you were asking Eric a question? <laughs> yeah, Eric, I was trying to see where you were going with this. It's clear there's a there's a problem in it. It doesn't seem to me the problem is going to be made much worse and certainly no better by adding four homes and, and the driveway that accesses this. The, the, well, the, uh, line, the, the line of sight rule, I believe, is 25 miles an hour it represents 250 feet of line of sight. Right. Okay. So, Nobody so goes 25 miles an hour through here. 
Right, so the permitting process is, is obviously gonna go off of the, the posted speed limit. They've, they've applied for, and I believe received uh, an okay from MDOT saying that, yeah, as long as it's 25 mile an hour zone, you, you can put your driveway where where you want to. Now, I, don't, what you're, I don't believe that that's 200 feet, 250 feet of line of sight from at least one of the uh, entrances. You're questioning the MDOT approval. You think it may be an error? Yes. Some, somebody help me with what the process is if, if uh, an abutter wants to challenge the MDOT approval? I have no idea how that's done. Um, my experience with MDOT is they're very particular and, and, and not always the easiest to, to get a permit from. So usually they're pretty good about their analysis, but I don't is, know. Is there a contact sure. number that, that uh, Eric could call MDOT and, and uh, ask what, what uh, you know, his, ask about his concern? The person who approved the MDOT analysis would be the person to contact to ask how to appeal that, to ask them to reevaluate. Or, or at least justify it. You know, perhaps there's some, some missing piece that, that isn't understood. Right, you can ask them to take another look at it. My experience with the state, if it's a state road, they will go in the posted speed limit and that's all they'll do. I'm not sure you would want that. Yeah, uh, certainly we can provide copies of the uh, of the DOT permits um, for you know for anyone who'd like a copy of those. Could you post them up there on the yeah. on the website? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, I'll make a note to um, you know to have those uh, posted to the website. What I heard Eric say, maybe incorrectly, is that. Um, the regulation is is that a 250 foot line of sight is required at a 25 mile an hour speed limit and he doesn't think that, that that's realized in this case obviously there's some discrepancy here it wouldn't take more than 10 minutes out here on any day before you would understand what i'm talking about no oh, if what you're saying is is that nobody's going 25 I think that's that's one issue, and and I that wouldn't be hard to confirm, and, and I don't even have to. I'm, I believe you, Tom. Tom just admitted to being one of the violators, <laughs> but uh, I, I think the point you're making is is that all that aside, even at 25 miles an hour, you don't think there's a 250 foot the required line of sight, and mm -hmm. that yeah, seems to me to be very straightforward. That's the requirement. Yeah. Correct. I think that's where MDOT needs to be engaged, you know, by, by a concerned abutter. Fair enough. And I um, may just take the second to um, acknowledge Mr. Olson, the abutter, that he has done some extensive uh, efforts into this. And I am pretty much uh, on his beside him with this, his efforts because he's really, uh, he's on top of it. I think he's got the right idea and I think he knows what he's talking about. Eric, you are, you are also in a butter, is that correct? Directly across the street from one of the entrances. Thank you. Okay, so. Who said? I'm sorry. Uh, you could bring him in for a second, but I, th I think the answer is we're going to be talking to him again here in two weeks. But uh, if he'd like to bring in one, talk briefly, that's okay.
Mr. Olson, are you here yet? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, just w yeah. one real quick comment around the line of sight and the speed. Would it be under the planning board's purview to install signage, asking people to slow down in that area? A flashing light signage, because it is, it's, you're taking your life into your hands when you pull out of your driveway. It's one of those we could ask. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, give that up to slow children type sign, right? Or... Yeah, I think uh, you know, and you know, in terms of that piece, that would be a request that I would make to the to the police department. Um, you know, and certainly engage the town manager in that you know in that request as well. Uh, but typically, that's um, you know, when there's a request for specific signage, uh, that usually goes through the PD. They sit in that lot on a daily basis trying to slow people down. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I guess at this point I'm going to ask for a motion to uh, continue the public hearing to the 1 July meeting. So moved. Okay, a second. Second. Larry, okay. Larry, yeah. All right, so I'm going to go through my list again. I'm in favor of that motion. Nina? Aye. Okay, Ed? Aye. Larry? Aye. Scott? Scott? <laughs> Hi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm waving at you down in this corner. Uh, anyway, good. Well, and then I only need one more motion. Oh, I'll okay, move to adjourn. Okay. I have a motion to adjourn. Second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody's waving in, in it. So we are we are adjourned. Thank you, David. <laughs> and thank you everybody. <laughs>